uh, to help uh, to organize so we can uh, be together on this section. So thank you uh, and for the invitation to be with the group uh, and it's just being wonderful. Um, before I go on to my pictures, I just like to set what we're going to do today. And my hope today is to talk about Jesus entering Jerusalem, you know, the Palm Sunday. Uh, so uh, last week, <clears throat> we talked about Jesus journeying from Galilee to Jerusalem. And today I want to talk about the last bit of, you know, from the Mount of Olives all the way to uh, the city of Jerusalem itself and the temple. Um, but I just want to remind you, I'm going to be focusing on the, the difficulty that people were facing at the time. The things that were difficult for the Jews in Jesus' time uh, in comparison to the Romans that were there, uh, in addition to the religious people, that kind of thing that's going on, and how everybody has something to fear of the other group. And, uh, and so try to remind us a few things that the Romans came and occupied the country of Israel. Therefore, the Jews are feeling under occupation. Uh, and therefore, rebellions are sprouting out everywhere. Uh, so the fact that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem and some of the things that Jesus is saying makes sense for us to understand when we realize that it was not a peaceful area or a peaceful time that you could say anything because it was quote unquote politically correct to say those things. We we're very much not correct and it was very much dangerous to do so. So it came to a point that we have in the gospel the expression that Jesus faced, uh, set his face to Jerusalem, meaning he understood no, by what I'm doing and what I've done so far, the next step is to go and to be trialed and imprisoned and perhaps you know, uh, killed. And that is okay with me. You now I have done enough of the work I have to do. And in here we need to understand a little bit is uh, that is a little bit um, uh, different um, that we have, of course, Jesus, the divine son of God, but we also have Jesus, the man that is dealing with those issues. So we cannot really separate one from the other. Jesus is not really just uh, the son of God. He was also the son of Mary. And as the son of Mary, he had compassion for his mother. He had compassion for his disciples. He had many friends that he wanted to protect. So you now he has this little dance that he needs to do to be able to say what he wants to say, but he had to be able to say on a way that is not super overt that will cause them to get in prison. And so let me give you a little bit of the background of the times just before, you no, know, um, 100 years before Jesus and 100 years after Jesus to see what is actually going on in Israel and why perhaps people are afraid and uh, there's so much concern that we have there. And when we realize that, then it would be easy for us to say, wow, what Jesus was saying and what Jesus was doing was very brave. Uh, and that you know, will give us to have a different dimension to be able to see that in our own aspects, all right? So let me share my screen with you. And then towards the end, I'll come back a few minutes before our time is over. <clears throat> and if anybody has a question or a comment or wants me to repeat some of the things, um, we can do that. So let me uh, give me a minute here to go back to my pictures. Uh, here, share screen. Here we go. Are we there? Okay, Anne, are you there? Here, but you're, I don't see anything. You don't see my picture yet? No. Okay, let's try again.
Okay, maybe now we've got there. a Yes. There you go. Yes. Voila. Ah, <laughs> good picture. Okay, <laughs> both of them. Yeah. So now a little bit before we start to get serious, just to remind, we have a trip going to Israel. Uh, I'll be the guide and Pastor Ann will be the spiritual leader of the trip together with others. Um, but it'll be a wonderful trip from uh, March 6th to the 19th. If any of you are interested and still can be spontaneous and go in less than a month, um, that'll be the time for you to sign up and go. Um, so it'll be a great trip for us and we need you there. But again, the time is very dangerous in Israel. And we can see that in several things. You know, the Romans kept very good trackings of their systems. Uh, and so we know that historical sources. But we know that in 63 BC, General Pompey conquered the land of Israel. So the Romans took over from uh, the, uh, the Hasmoneans that were there before that. So we went from being a free country to being a country under the occupation of the Romans. Um, and uh, that is not too bad in itself. The Romans were a very large empire and they did not have much uh, problems in allowing people to have a certain kind of freedom as far as they pay their taxes and their duties to the Romans. And they even could use their own coins. So the way that you make coins in Israel or in the time was that you have a disc of metal and you have a hammer with the impression on it. And then you just slam the hammer into the disc of metal that you have. And then you make the impression on it. So you see here on these two pictures that I have you known the uh, front side and the back side of the same coin. You can see that the back side, the one on the right, is not exactly on the rim of the disc because the person aimed a little bit too high and missed it. So that happens a lot. And we see lots of that in um, old coins. So that's okay because they did not have really a printing press for the coins. And the coins were also very uh, localized. So every king or every region could have their own coins for that purpose. This is a fascinating coin because it's probably the only picture we have of the facade of the temple in Jerusalem. So the picture on the left, it shows the facade of the temple uh, because this coin was minted in uh, 160 BC, even before the Romans came to the country. So it's a Hasmonean uh, coin that we have and with the Hebrew letters around and the temple in the front of the coin. So Pompey comes in in 63 BC and he conquered the country and he changes the, the systems and he in, implements the Roman authority in it. The Romans were of course very pagan in their own traditions. They had temples to multiple gods uh, and their main capital was in Rome, in Italy. Uh, so to be under the Roman occupation was not desirable for anybody but much more not desirable for a country that is religious as Israel is. While many other countries did not have a problem to accept the gods of the Romans, Israel was not interested in any of the gods of the Romans because the whole basis of the Jewish religion is the God, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. So when the Romans came and tried to say, look, you worship our gods and we worship your gods. Um, Here's some statues of our gods. You, keep, you give us a statue of your god. No, the local uh, religious population didn't have a statue of the god of Israel to give to the Romans. So therefore, right there, we have a little impasse that there's not really many ways to do it or any way to uh, solve it other than um, conflicts. But... <clears throat> Then the Romans start appointing the, the kings or the leaders for, to control Israel. And one of those leaders will be Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas was given the territory of Galilee to be his capital, to be his region. 
And his capital was in a city called Sephoris. Sephoris um, became his capital and he um, was um, happy to rule from over there. But at 3 BC, the capital of Sephoris rebelled against the Roman governor or rebelled against Antipas. And he needed to be so strong to be able to control uh, the re re rebellion uh, against himself that every, uh, all the Jewish population of that town was either killed or sold into slavery. So we know from historical sources that after 3 BC was no more Jewish population living in Sephoris. Later on, that same king is the king who builds Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. And when he was building Tiberias, he inaugurated Tiberias on the year 18 uh, AD. But when he uh, is preparing to inaugurate his new city to move his capital to that city, he, he meant this coin that we see here. He's trying to um, do two things. He's trying to show the Romans that is strong enough to force the Roman uh, law into the, this Jewish population. But then he knows that the Jewish should not be very acceptive. So he's trying to put a symbol on his coin that perhaps the Jewish people would not know. So he put this little curly Q that we have on this coin on the left. And you see the, um, the, uh, that is a symbol of a scepter that pagan gods would hold on or they'll be used on the temples. So when the Jewish people rebelled against that coin and refused to touch the coin because it was a pagan symbol, in order to calm the people down and not to have another revolt on his hands like he had in the forest, he um, changed his coins. And he went to the Jewish and asked, what do you want on your coins? And the Jewish people said, we'll take plants or vegetables or shapes, no, but not animals or humans or God, no, things or idol things. So he decided to put a palm tree on their coins or the new coins just to calm the population down and not to be able to have another revolt that probably will look very bad on his resume in Rome. So the emperor of Rome, in order to control those leaders of the local regions, and in order to control the people under those regions, um, had a very clear rule. If you have a revolt that you cannot control, you are banished from, the, from the, um, your position. And apparently in Rome time, to be banished to a barbarian land was such a bad thing that most of the people that are banished uh, end up committing suicide. So here is another pic of the same, another coin of the same picture with the palm tree that allows him then to calm the population and control them a little better. So let me go through a list of things here. Um, in 6 AD, another ruler of the the lands of Israel um, called Archelaus were banished because he could not stop a revolt from a man called Judas of Galilee. Pontius Pilate, that we know well from the Gospels, came to power in 26 and he stayed until 36 AD. He had a bunch of problems with the Jewish people, with the Jewish population. He had a bunch of problems with the Romans and trying to be, um, no, uh, fair or at least you know, try to keep both of them under control. But in 36 AD, he had a, revol a revolt from the Samaritans in Samaria. The Samaritans want to have a, a worship time in their temple in Mount Gerizim. And Pontius Pilate refused to authorize that. The Samaritans revolted against the, uh, his authority and he was not able to control that revolt. And Pontius Pilate was banished into, in, into a barbarian lands. And we know from, another, from other historical documents that he actually committed suicide three years later, 
in 39 AD, he killed himself. And that's because of the, uh, the Samaritan revolt. On the same year, 39, Caligula, the emperor of Rome, dies. So that was a good news. The problem is that before he died, he had full plans of putting a statue of Jupiter in the temple of Jerusalem. Fortunately, uh, Tiberius and other governors of the area were able to uh, convince uh, Caligula, the emperor, that we don't have marble that's good enough to make a statue of the god Jupiter to be in Jerusalem. And we don't have artists skilled enough. So let's postpone and let's wait until we can get that. And then uh, we'll really have a first class statue to put in the temple of Jerusalem. What they are doing is because they knew that there's no way that will not be, uh, that they'll be able to control a revolt if somebody, if the Romans come in with soldiers to bring that statue into the holy temple of Jerusalem uh, without so much bloodshed. Fortunately, Caligula dies in the year 39 AD, and he never had time to make that statue to put in Jerusalem, solving that problem. But many of the Jews that were very moderate Jews and very accepting of the Romans, when they realized that if Rome is producing this kind of emperors that are that crazy to bring a statue into the temple of Jerusalem, perhaps we all should become more anti-Roman or the, the word that we have in the Bible, may, perhaps we can be more zealot and maybe we can be more zealot to our faith to the point of being violent towards Rome. That movement, the zealot movement is also called dagger carriers. And uh, that is pretty much what they used to do. There'll be a group of people <clears throat> that have a very nice little dagger on them. And whenever they had an opportunity, there's a Roman soldier somewhere in the market, they would come quietly from behind and stab the soldier uh, you know, on the back or wherever he, they could and leave the dagger on and go away quickly. Well, the soldier, of course, will start screaming or pain and people come to see what happens until by the time that they remove his robes to find what is on him, they will find that little dagger on. And that is a clue, it's a little calling card to uh, let them know that the person who did that was a zealot. So we have many of the, those groups very active during the time of Jesus. Well, Antipas, Antipas is uh, the coin and then he needs to calm the people to be able to do that. Antipas is, is banished in 39 AD uh, because of Sicarii uh, revolt or you know, the tumult they're causing, uh, but particularly because Agrippa uh, went to Rome and um, told the emperor, you know, one of those intrigue that we have between uh, leaders um, report to Rome that he had not done a good job uh, controlling the Zealot revolt. So very interesting, but it continues on. And even after Jesus' death, uh, when the Romans finally controlled Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, the Romans, the uh, emperor um, Titus issued this coin, that, the drawing that we have here. So a palm tree on the middle of the coin, a woman, Judea is a female word. So a woman representing Judea no, sitting on the floor with her back to the palm tree. And on the left side of the, the coin, a large Roman soldier standing up, facing the palm tree. So there's no question that palm tree became a symbol of independence for the Jewish nation. See the inscription that we have there, Judea capta, the, the captivity of the country called Judea. So that's good for us to see there. Here's the uh, coins. <clears throat> and of course you can see them in many shapes and many uh, ways. Um, 
because you know, there is the way that they are prepared. They don't really have one master, but they have many masters to do it. But it's the same idea. The woman with the back to the palm tree and a very oversized Roman soldier showing the power uh, of Rome uh, and the words Judea capta in there. Galilee is a very pastoral place. Uh, there's much space between one city and the other. And there is where Jesus uh, used so much of his time teaching and, and preaching and walking from place to place uh, with the people. So it's, even today, as we're traveling through Galilee, it's really a wonderful uh, place to visit. <clears throat> but then Jesus comes to Jerusalem. The journey of the Palm Sunday it starts in the, in the Gospels in a city called Bethpage. Uh, it's a great name for a city because we I still use that word today. Uh, it's actually two words uh, that uh, has a meaning. So to know what that means is great and that helps us on our understanding. So Bethpage means the house of the early fig. The house of the early fig. Beth is house. Page is the name for the fig. Um, on the uh, teachings of Jesus on that last week, they are going from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives and they come to a tree, to a fig tree. And Jesus goes to the fig tree and he starts looking for figs. And then the, the, the same stories in the Bible says, but it was not the season for figs. And then continues by saying, and Jesus found no figs, and he cursed the fig tree. Next day, they come through, and the disciples pointed out, saying, look, Lord, the tree that you spoke to yesterday is totally dry today. So if I had time to ask you, if I could see you, uh, I would ask, what is wrong with this story? If it's not the season for figs, why is Jesus looking for figs? And the answer, if you're a gardener, uh, you probably know it, is that the fig trees have two kinds of figs. As soon as the fig tree starts putting leaves, a little fig comes under it. Uh, let's see if I have another picture here, like here. So the figs are just putting up the fig, the leaves, and the little fig comes out. That little fig is not really um, a fig that's too early, it's early, early in the spring. That little fig is never going to grow big, strong, and sweet. That little fig is not in Hebrew, it is not called fig, it's called pagi. Pagi, meaning early fig. Eventually, that little fig will fall off, and another fig comes on its place, and towards, more towards the summer. And that one grows into being a nice, big, juicy, uh, sweet fig like we're used to. So what's the problem of our text? The problem of our text is translation. If you read that in Hebrew, it would say, Jesus was hungry and he went looking for pagi because it was not the time for figs. And he used the two words. And the later fig is called teena. The early fig is called pagi. So Jesus went looking for pagi because it was not the time for teena. And he did not find any of them. So what Jesus is pointing out here is that if a fig tree is not producing the early fig, it is also not going to produce the later fig. Therefore, is a tree that's not serving a purpose uh, and is only taking space on the, on the land of the farmer. So it's interesting for us to have that um, a name of a fig gave us the name of the city where Jesus went to pick up the little donkey. So in the gospels, in, um, we have the story of Jesus coming and sending the disciples to find a donkey that was sitting, uh, that was some there. And Jesus even tells the disciples, if somebody asks you, just tell them that the Lord needs it. So I like to think that perhaps Jesus, out of consideration for the honor of the donkey, had called him the night before and said, no, 
my disciples are coming to pick up the baby donkey and don't worry, I'll bring it back um, when I'm done with it. So don't, you know, just let them have it. But it's great to think that Jesus then enters on the donkey and um, comes into Jerusalem. So, but here we have another issue that we need to address. Where is that Jerusalem starts? Where do you count as being the city limits? Because Jesus is taking the donkey way up on the Mount of Olives. But that is like a half a mile to Jerusalem. Is that still part of Jerusalem? And there is some uh, Jewish books that the rabbis discuss how far is the city limit of Jerusalem by using the expression, how far can you carry the bread uh, of Thanksgiving and still be inside where we're allowed to carry it? Uh, there is an understanding in rabbinical Judaism that uh, you only can carry things inside of the city. And, but if you carry outside of the city line, you are um, breaking the law. So you decide where the lines are. And then the rabbis on that discussion agrees that the city line of Jerusalem is where Beth Page is. So it just goes all the way to that line and waits for the little donkey to come. And then he sits on the donkey. Now, what's beautiful here, again, is one of those things that you needed to have ears to hear and eyes to see. If you are familiar with the biblical scriptures, you'd know that Zechariah and Joel mentioned more than once that your king, the Messiah, will come, will enter Jerusalem sitting on a donkey. The Romans perhaps did not know that description, so they're not worried about a, a person uh, no, enter Jerusalem on a donkey. But if you are a student of the Hebrew Bible, you would know that that is what Jesus is doing. So this is one of the most uh, overt symbols or situations that Jesus um, allows people to see him as the Messiah. Well, people paid the favor, the compliment with another compliment because they went and they grabbed branches and put under the little donkey for the donkey to step on as Jesus entered Jerusalem. So you see here we have Jesus saying by sitting on the donkey, I am the one that was promised to come according to the ancient prophets. And the, and the people of Jerusalem understanding that run and cut palm branches. Palm branches for a century has been the symbol of our independence. So it makes sense for them to put palm branches for the donkey to enter the city. One other thing that I can add here is that remember they are taking out their robes and putting their robes on the floor on the on the road so the donkey steps on it also. So that could be that he's doing they're doing a nice gesture of paving the way for the Messiah. But the other thing that we need to keep in mind is what important symbol is on every Jewish uh, man in the time of Jesus um, on his robes. And that will be the tassels. Uh, the tassels is a symbol of the person's importance. The tassel is a symbol of person's uh, legions. It's like your um, identity card. And it's great because we have these stories in the Bible that <clears throat> when David, King David, was fleeing from King Saul in the uh, springs or caves of Engedi, uh, David came up from behind and cut the tassels of the king's robe. And then the king said, now I see that you'll be the next king of Israel because the tassels, the authority was in the hands of David. On the New Testament, when uh, Saul is getting ready to stone um, Stephen, the first Christian mur murder, People, the Bible says, took their robes and put their robes under Saul's feet. So literally, the people are saying, we are throwing the stone, we're throwing the stones, but you are the one responsible for it. Now you, we're putting our authority, our tassels under your feet. And here we have all these people 
in the Mount of Olives, taking their robes that contains their symbol of authority and putting under Jesus' uh, entry um, animal to Jerusalem. And other people are cutting palm branches saying, um, this is our symbol of identity. And if you're the Messiah, we hope the Messiah will be a king. Therefore, we hope that you can be our deliverer. For many years, this man uh, has this white donkey and he's always on the Mount of Olives and he allows people to take picture. Um, he's a really uh, icon of Jerusalem. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to see him again uh, when we're there. Uh, this is just a little donkey in the desert in Jerusalem. And donkeys are really cute little baby animals. So I couldn't resist to put this one there, but it's very nice to have in there. The other connection that we have with donkeys is that David, King David, rides the donkey when he's anointed king of Israel. His sons, uh, Absalom, also rides a donkey to go to the Gihon Springs to be anointed king. So in Judaism, uh, king, the, the riding a donkey is a very symbolical uh, messianic and king uh, signs of a king that Jesus was taken authority from. Jesus is constantly called the son of David. So the son of David has the authority of David. David was the king uh, mm -hmm. and he rode a donkey. Jesus is the king and he's riding, riding a donkey. So those connections are there. And that is why it's important for us to know the traditions of the time and geography of the time so we can put those things together and um, <clears throat> keep, be aware of the thing that is happening in there. This is a view from the city of Jerusalem up to the Mount of Olives. So uh, we remember from seeing that tower over there. And here is from the other side, from the Mount of Olives, looking down um, to, to the city of Jerusalem. So we will be um, going to be at this viewpoint and have that view to talk about. Remember over here, well, you already seen this picture on my last um, week, but you have the Jewish tombs just below the people. And then there's a big deep valley that's the Kidron Valley. And then on the other side of the city, you have the Muslim cemetery just outside of the walls. And then the city walls and where the golden dome is today is the place where the temple of Jerusalem stood. So Jesus needs to go from this mountain, the top of this mountain, through the side over here uh, and find a path. Then he comes down to the bottom of the valley. Then he needs to go up the valley to get to the city walls where the gate is for him to enter Jerusalem. But I don't know if you remember, just to add to our uh, point of being a dangerous time for people to be uh, with Jesus on that day, is that people are saying Hosanna, Hosanna, and singing songs of liberation that Jesus is uh, coming to Jerusalem. Some well-meaning uh, uh, Pharisees, Jesus' friends, religious Jewish people from the temple, told Jesus to ask that his disciples to keep it down. Uh, but it's interesting, as they get closer and closer to the city, at one point, the adults stop singing Hosanna, Hosanna, and they send their children. You see, they're very aware of the authority of the Romans being nearby. Therefore, a child cannot be really arrest, arrested, but a parent can. So the parents stood back and said, you little uh, Miriam, you little Moshe, go over there and you keep saying Hosanna, Hosanna. So when we see that, sometimes in our American culture, we might think, wasn't that nice of them to allow their little children to sing? But if you live under occupation, you probably very easily will realize they're letting the children sing because they cannot be arrested. We have a very good experience on that in Israel in, in uh, past years. Uh, we had a very big um, Israel 
has the problem with the Palestinians and the Palestinians um, until the Oslo Accord was not able to hold their flags. There was illegal to have a Palestinian flag uh, on your house, on your car, or in your building. So people under occupation find ways around. So many of the Boy Scouts changed their uniforms to have the colors of the Palestinian flag because you cannot be arrested by wearing a uniform that happens to have the, the colors. The colors of the Palestinians, it, uh, the Palestinian flag is red, black, blue, no, red, red, white, black, and green. It was very interesting to see how um, mothers would decide to do the, their laundry by color and color coordinate their lines. So be one black shirt, one green pants. So looking like the flag hanging on their clothesline, nobody can be arrested for doing laundry, right? The fact that you know that this looks like my flag is another thing. So the same thing for the Jewish people in the time of Jesus, they're very aware of the political situation and they're able to try to do as much as they can from getting in trouble without giving up what they believe. So the beautiful view of Jerusalem, the temple area that we discussed before, this rectangle where the dome is and how crowded the city inside of the city walls is. Another one here on the springtime that shows a little bit more grass on the fields. And you can see some of the excavations um, around, the, around the temple area. So that is the direction. The temple is where Jesus is going to. So closer from the, now we're in the valley, uh, the Kidron Valley, looking up towards Jerusalem. You can see the Golden Gate over there, uh, the Muslim cemetery against the uh, city walls, and then the terraces of the Kidron Valley over here. So that's the direction that Jesus is coming from the top of the Mount of, of Olives towards the city of Jerusalem. But as people are singing to Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna, bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he um, got sad and he wept over Jerusalem. There's a little church on that same area that remembers that fact that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And it's called Dominus Flavit or our Lord wept. But if you position yourself on the right place like this uh, photo that I have here, you can, through the window of the church, take a picture of the Dome of the Rock. And you see right there, just below the dome, the, the golden dome, there's a cross. That cross is on the altar of the church. So you could even position yourself a little bit to the uh, right or to the left, and then you could put that cross on top of the dome um, and, um, and have that you no know, expression for you to have. But that is the church that remembers that Jesus cries uh, over Jerusalem because he knows that um, the future is not bright and peaceful. He knows that something, a revolt would, has to come. He had predicted his death. He had predicted the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So Jesus could uh, see uh, apparently the future in this moment and he was um, able to cry over the city of Jerusalem, confusing a little bit, in my opinion, of all the people that were around him uh, celebrating that the Messiah is coming and now Jesus is just taking the opposite direction of that. And that church is where Jesus says, how much I wish to gather you under my wings, like a mother hen gather her chicks. So the church was, was nice to put this little hen and all the little baby chicks. But you see, it's a holy hen. You see the halo over the chicken head? So that is on the altar. So if you're coming with us in March, uh, we'll be able to go to this little church and uh, take those pictures by ourselves and, and see how beautiful it is and read the scriptures over there. But it's a very, a very traumatic time. 
Um, part of the problem with that, that time is that it's just before Passover. Passover, uh, remember we already had a talk like this. Passover is the time that you celebrate that you were um, slaved in Egypt and God freed you from captivity. And now hundreds of years later, when you are in your land of Israel, the Romans are there and you don't feel that you're free. Even though you're celebrating uh, and you're eating the Paschal lamb and you're eating the uh, unleavened bread and you're doing what well, well, you're supposed to do. But because of the Romans presence in Jerusalem, you don't really feel that you're free. And you're looking for a Messiah that would come and free you from that situation that we have there. On the bottom of that walk, we come to one of the most beautiful churches, uh, in my opinion, um, in Jerusalem, is the Church of All Nations, and is on the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and that is a very, very um, beautiful and very well uh, designed church. There's a lot of features inside. For example, is in that church that Jesus says, if it's possible, pass this chalice from me. So the altar of the church is on the shape of a wine glass. See how, the, how it boils down over here? And that's the whole table of the altar of that um, beautiful church. And you see how they decided to do the marble by cutting and putting the pieces in different positions so they form those nice designs that you have around there. Right in front of the altar that looks like a, um, a wine glass, you have this uh, bedrock, a piece of rock that sticks out. And according to tradition, that is the rock where Jesus prayed that prayer, you know, let this chalice pass from me. But today is right in front of the church itself or the, or the altar itself. So it's a great place for us to be. So is there that uh, Jesus will going to spend some time praying later on that night. The church is a church that received donations for many nations to help uh, to build the church. And if you see here uh, in one of the domes of the church um, that was donated by the United States, um, they managed to put their symbol, uh, the American symbol on the dome itself. So have a little American flag in one of the domes of that church um, that represents you know, the suffering and the agony of Jesus. One thing that Israel is not short of is prophecies that say that God is going to restore the nation of Israel. God is going to bring back the kingdom of Israel and the temple of Israel and the presence of the Lord never really left Jerusalem uh, and those things are really important for us to keep in mind because whenever you are talking to anybody that knows much about Israel, that's one of the things that are going always to come up. So when you're having the conditions or the um, positions of the palm fronts uh, for the Palm Sunday is here, it's good for us to be wise and know what does that really represent. Perhaps at the day, when people are waving these palm fronts, perhaps every palm front was like a big poster wishing Pontius Pilate to go home. You cannot really say that, but you can wave the palm branches as high as you can, as strong as you can, making that statement that you're there. So it's really uh, important for us to be able to see the connection that we have between the ride and the donkey as a uh, thing that a king would do and waving the palms as a wishful thing of uh, a symbol of our independence. Israel is not short by any means of palm trees. Uh, of course, the palm trees that we have in Israel, they're either just um, palm trees that are just beautiful trees and doesn't produce much fruit, or like is more the case of today, the palm trees, they produce the dates. And we have tons and, and thousands and thousands of trees like that. So this is just one of them. 
that has just bunch of nice dates that um, eventually will be sold in the market. <clears throat> so to be able to have the comparison of the two, uh, make the story of the palms even more important for um, to be used on coins because we will really consider that to be part of the <clears throat> independence side. The Mount of Olives walk down brings us to very close to this church. This is the church of Mary Magdalena. It's a Russian Orthodox church. Um, it's normally a hard church to visit because it's open just a few hours, a couple of days a week. Uh, so it's hard to organize to go in that church, but it's just part of that same aerial view that, uh, that we're going to be walking when we're there. So here I have another picture that shows uh, the point from the Jerusalem area, from the temple area, looking up to the Mount of Olives. Um, another thing that we have here that I have to bring up this time I, again is the taxations. The reason that the Romans would keep the, those countries and many of these countries that we have under control you know, the Roman Empire was so large because they conquered other smaller kingdoms and just annexed to the Roman Empire. The reason that they have that need is <clears throat> because they need somebody to pay their bills. So the taxation of the conquered nations are very heavy, very heavy. So you have a large percentage of a tax that every individual or every Na uh, country or area needs to send it to Rome. That's what Rome's demands. But then your own local governor or local king would have his own taxes because he ne needs to have his own palaces and his own guards and his own comfort uh, that we have there. Then you have um, religious taxes that you need to pay. For example, every Jewish person was required to pay so much, a certain amount um, just for being um, Jewish. So in the end of the uh, situation is a huge number of uh, the person's income that are not used by the family, but is transferred um, to Rome in a way or another. So leaving very little for them to survive on. So that is one of the things that we make um, to be uh, to that would make to be under Roman occupation a very undesirable thing, and that is another thing that's easy for us to overlook, because it's easier to think that under Rome we had the Pax Romana, meaning we had security on the roads and we had security to travel by sea. Well, we have to agree that Pax Romana was good for the Romans but everybody else was even pushed further into some kind of oppression in order to be able to have that Pax Romana. So every rebellion that you try to have or every freedom that you try to have is really controlled. Um, it's really surprising to us that for three and a half years, Jesus was able to have such, such large crowds while, when he's speaking in Galilee. Uh, and part of the reasons of that is because uh, Jesus has friends that can somewhat control and somewhat protect him. Um, we know, for example, that one of the problems that we had between two brothers, two king brothers in the time of Jesus, uh, is what caused the death of John the Baptist. John the Baptist lived in the territory of Herod Antipas. But Herod Antipas, a few years back, had started dating his brother's wife. So Herod Antipas started dating the wife of Herod Philip. And eventually she moved in with him uh, to live in Tiberias. So needless to say, Philip really did not like Antipas. So at one time, in Jesus' ministry, Jesus needed to be uh, more away from the crowds 
And Jesus took the disciples up to the Golan Heights, that was the territory of Herod Philip, where he could be more private. And he knew that the soldiers of Herod Antipas would not come over the border looking for him because the two brothers did not have a good relationship and they had no connection between the two countries. So, oh, just to say, friends, that the uh, area around Israel during the time of Jesus was not very peaceful. Perhaps you had a time of quiet every now and then, but if you just scratch a little bit below the surface, you would find all this resentment and all this problem that you have between one group and another. What I want to leave with you uh, today is that was because Jesus allowed the disciples to say Hosanna, Hosanna on the Mount of Olives. And when they got closer to Jerusalem, they sent their children to say Hosanna, Hosanna. That allowed the Romans to see that the movement, the Jewish, the Jesus movement was large enough that they needed to be careful or that could become another revolution that potentially would turn them into um, um, people that is sent into exile. Later on, on the book of Acts, and I'll finish with that, on the book of Acts, chapter five, verse 26, we hear the Sanhedrin people, the religious people of the temple, talking about the disciples of Jesus and saying, we should arrest them without violence because of the crowds. So it's great for us to see that Jesus was able to empower his followers enough that they could make a point and that the authorities would realize that enough people, a large crowd, even if they don't have power, they can make people in power to think twice. And we know that because they are considering how to, um, how to deal with the disciples when they're preaching the gospels and they're you know, unhappy with that situation, but they needed to do it without violence because they're afraid of the crowds. And the crowds themselves prove themselves strong enough, long enough through history to make all these leaders to be banished into uh, barbarian lands throughout the uh, Jewish history that will keep them from growing. I hope that this helped you some in our studies, in our preparation for Easter, uh, and to appreciate a little bit more of what is Jesus being able to do for us. So let's see if I can stop and come back. Uh, to There we go. Are we back? Yes. Good. So let's see here. I need to change my picture there. Is there any question or, or a comment or something that I left that was unclear? I know it's a lot of material and a lot of dates and a lot of names, um, and you're not required to remember those uh, that information. Um, my point was just to build uh, uh, no the, the side uh, information for us to have uh, in there. So this is really um, more information that you deserve just late in the evening. Ananya, yes. What was that big tower uh, on uh, Mount Olives? Behind, it oh. was in the background. Yes, the one that we saw is a church, is you know, it's a big, big uh, Christian church in the Mount of Olives that remember the place of Jesus' ascension. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Nani. Yeah. Go ahead, Jennifer. Um, was it known that the the donkey that Jesus rode in was white? We don't know. Okay. Uh, he's just said that it's a young donkey nobody rode yet. Um, but we don't have any more information than that. Okay. Uh, I remember for years hearing Jim 
saying that the children connected to his city meant the people that were the poor people that were living outside the city. That's correct. And in your lecture tonight, it sounded like you were saying that they sent the children because the children could be safe. Correct. When, when, as, as Jesus got closer and closer to the temple, you know, the Roman soldiers are protecting the temple area in, in the city. So it became less and less safe for the adults to say Hosanna, Hosanna. So this, this is a clue that perhaps they are um, sending their children um, and not themselves. Hanania, the different um, graves going down, were, how much of that was there during when Jesus was going down to the uh, Jerusalem? Well, what we know is that that cemetery, the Jewish cemetery, was already there. Okay. So it has to be you know, a, a road somewhere that you know, went through the cemetery without entering the cemetery itself. So probably very much the road that we walk is, uh, I would believe that that's very close to where the path was at the time. So the Muslim cemetery might not have been there? Oh, the Muslim cemetery, no. The Muslim, we don't have Muslim until the seventh century AD. Okay. Muhammad was born in 630 AD. Okay. So yeah. Anania, uh, Ken, uh, I find it impressive that Jesus rode a donkey that had never been ridden before. I would ask how many of you would ever try to get <laughs> on an animal like that that had never been ridden before? <laughs> I think yes, our, Lord, our Lord had some control over that animal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that donkeys were gentler in those days because they were just used for everything. Yes. So they were kind of born with that attitude instead of nowadays. Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. No, it's not. It's a, it's a donkey that probably born in a stable kind of thing, you know, in, in a farm already, you know, the mother and father being already tamed. So perhaps, but yeah, that doesn't make Jesus doesn't have a control of the, of the animal. <laughs> Hanania, I had a question. Um, this is Nancy. Um, you said at one point something about God is going to restore the temple. And I just wondered what the different viewpoints were um, from the Jews or uh, yes. just going on there what is the mindset there yes what i said was that we have plenty of uh, prophecies in the old testament that talks about the restoration of israel the returning of jewish you know, authority and all those things and their prophecies so therefore anybody who reads it reads with their own eyes and uh, the prophecy is saying whatever i want the prophecy to say you know, like in many traditions so um, I'm really not expert in prophecies, but we do have enough prophecies like in, in um, Ezekiel or in Joel that literally says that you know, um, God is coming to the land of Israel and uh, Judah will live in Jerusalem forever. Uh, the kingdom will be restored. So we have those, uh, those expressions that of course can be interpreted anyway the person wants depending on which direction they are. Um, in modern Israel, there is a belief that Messiah needs to come to rebuild the temple. So therefore, there's not much that I can do or anybody can do other than hope that Messiah will come back to do it. So that's one uh, point of it. But the other point that we have, we have a very, uh, very good group in Israel that's called the Temple Institute. And they are a group of Orthodox Jews that work very hard in building everything that they can in advance. They know that they cannot build a temple, 
but doesn't keep them from making all the chalices, all the shovels, all the incense, all the studies, all the robes. And eventually when Messiah comes, they can say, hey, Messiah, here's a warehouse full of materials that you can use. We did our, no, we did, we start preparation. But the other, the other place, no, mainly are um, prophecies and therefore they're hard to interpret it exactly what they're supposed to mean. Thank you. How about another comment? I know that some of you heard this story before. So where was Jesus' mother when he was riding the donkey into Jerusalem? Where was Mary? Do you know? Um, I wouldn't be surprised. No, some, some scholars like to think that Mary was on the road with Jesus. Okay. And then traveling with him like Mary Magdalena and other women that was following with Jesus, that his mother would be one of them. Uh, I would think that she would be very interested uh, in coming to Jerusalem for the holidays, you know, for Passover, that's such an important pilgrimage holiday. Uh, so could be that was in Jerusalem because then she is at the cross, you know, just a few days later. So yes, I think it's safe to say that she was in Jerusalem um, because then she, on the crucifixion, uh, she is at the foot of the cross. I would like to commend you for this excellent synthesis of uh, Jewish symbolism during this uh, important time of of, uh, of Jesus. This was a remarkable amount Thank of work you. On, your, on your part to bring bring the palm and the donkey and all of this together with, uh, of course, with the geography and the and the chronology of that spinal week. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's, it, I think that's really important, and, and I think that's wonderful to be able to combine you know, what is symbolism and what is on purpose and try to you know, see why this is happening. Um, I mean, I, we need to believe that everything that's in the Bible, being the Holy Scriptures, are there for our teaching, mm -hmm. for our learning. So therefore, everything is important, and then it's you know, our our job to, to find and to decipher between them and to find out where should we put more emphasis or less emphasis. So this is great. And we're living in fantastic times that we have such, such knowledge and such uh, ways to study old scriptures and translate writings that we never knew before uh, and then have the archeological sites and find coins. And who knew that one coin could say so much Mm -hmm. about the person who prepared it and made it. Uh, it's just, no, we're living in a great time for that. This is Ken Van Dyne. I have been to Israel with Hanania and Jim, and you'll never find anyone that can know more about the area and and give you the information you need. So I would certainly recommend that you go with them. Thank you. Thank you, that's very kind of you. A subject that comes up in our class frequently yes. is the ambiguity of Hebrew and, and in reading the scholarly interpretations of, of the Old Testament. Uh, how difficult it is to uh, to understand uh, exactly what what the intent was, and frequently scholars differ on that. So, yes. for for those of us who are interested, how big a project is this to get to some kind of a uh, understanding, some kind of a understanding of of the Hebrew, the written, not not spoken, but but written yes. Hebrew. I mean, how many years is this? Five years, 10 years of study? <laughs> well, <clears throat> pretty much it depends on how immersed in the culture you are. Uh, there's, there are very good uh, Hebrew courses in Jerusalem that provide enough knowledge for the students in a year and a half to go back to their countries and translate parts of the Bible. 
So what is amazing, but they needed to sign an agreement that for that year and a half, even if they have other friends in the, in the course, they have to speak in Hebrew and they need to shop in Hebrew and they need to dream in Hebrew and, no, and really apply themselves. There is no other studies other than the language uh, in that. Um, Hebrew is not a difficult language. Hebrew <clears throat> very much reads what it is there. So uh, when, when you learn that this symbol is the S symbol and this one is the T symbol, when you put them together, it's not difficult to read. Um, it gets a little complicated because we don't write the vowels. So you need to sound the letters or the words and you need to guess more or less. Now there's guide, guidelines for where you should put which vowel, uh, but there is no written vowels. Um, so it's a little bit confusing uh, at first for that. Um, but it's not, it's not super hard. Little kids in Israel speak Hebrew all the time. <laughs> Seven years old are reading and writing. Yeah, even a child can speak French. How, how difficult can it be? <laughs> <laughs> Nanya, are you, uh, this is Steve Stanley. How are you? Hey, good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, I was wondering, do you guys offer a uh, Hebrew class that we can learn Hebrew and is thought about that? Um, it's very interesting. Um, even though I lived in Israel for uh, almost 30 years and you know, I'm, I'm fluent, I you know, raised my children speaking Hebrew, I somehow, somewhat never felt comfortable teaching Hebrew. Uh, and if if we if we would teach Hebrew in our ministry, it would be me. Um, so no, not yet. <laughs> Maybe something that I need to do on, on you know, weekends, but no, I have not tried to do that yet. Oh, okay. It would be a fun thing to do. Huh. We have many many words in Hebrew that we know them from the scriptures. Um, that would be great to focus on individual words rather than trying to learn the, the, the language um, because there's some words that are very deep and very meaningful uh, in Hebrew. So when you read uh, that in the Psalms or in the prophets, uh, just give a, a different depth of understanding in there. Uh, and that, that wouldn't be too hard to do. Or just to choose those words and every week learn a new word. Thanks, Steve, for more things to do. <laughs> I do what I can. <laughs> My brother is a minister, and when he went to a seminary, one of the basic things that most ministers, Presbyterian, which I am, uh, they have to take a course in Hebrew, mm -hmm. and they have to take a course in Greek. So if you really want to speak Hebrew, that may be a way to do it. Go to seminary and take a course. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, but Hebrew became a much popular language. So I wouldn't be surprised that there's, there's plenty of um, courses online or other places that are being offered already. You know, like the, uh, yeah. Okay. Hanania, would you mention something about uh, what language Jesus may have spoken when he came, uh, you know, to this, in addition to Hebrew, he probably spoke Aramean and- Yes, yes. We, we think that Jesus, uh, we know that Jesus spoke Hebrew because in Luke chapter two, he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth and he reads from the scrolls and all our Jewish scrolls are in Hebrew. Um, we also know that the common language in Jesus time was Aramaic. Aramaic is a kind of Hebrew that is more popular, like a poor Hebrew uh, that the people that did not went to school would learn. So everybody, uh, the population would speak Aramaic and um, particular women and children would be fluent in Aramaic. And then the men that had a chance to go to um, synagogue school, they will be trained in Hebrew. 
and probably that's how Jesus learned his Hebrew. Mm -hmm. um, and but at least those two languages Jesus was able to uh, be fluent on. Um, the Hebrew meaning he could um, read. There is a couple of verses in the New Testament that Jesus is writing uh, with his finger on the sand, but there's no translation of what he was writing or nobody wrote it or took a picture. So we don't know if he was really writing letters or just not making lines on, on the sand. Um, one of those stories is the woman that's about to be stoned. Um, so Jesus started writing on the sand and then he looked up at the woman and tells her where you're, you know, I don't accuse you, go in peace. But we don't know um, more than that if he just was able to write or not. Um, the, the expression in the Bible that says that Jesus spoke with authority normally, normally is understood that Jesus spoke on his own name. You know, like if you are a really educated person and you're speaking to a crowd, you should say, according to Dr. So-and-so and according to Professor so-and-so, I can say this or that. Uh, and that is what the rabbis required. You're supposed to say, according to Rabbi Gamliel, or according to Rabbi Hillel, um, I say this or that. And Jesus always said, I say to you. Mm -hmm. So that could be either he was taking authority or could be that he didn't really had the training to say uh, this rabbi said this, therefore I'll build on what he said. Um, uh, even today, you know, if, you, if you're ever invited to speak it to a Jewish audience, it's expected that you, um, you mention the footnotes. According to so-and-so, um, in the year so-and-so, I'm saying this to you based on that point. So it's um, very un unlikely that um, a sermon, a Jewish sermon in a synagogue would not come with those footnotes. Berlin, it's very nice that you could join us today. I'm glad I could too. I almost called you to get a picture of Pepe to show <laughs> tonight, but then I ran out of time. Oh, well, I've <laughs> got plenty, plenty of pictures of him. <laughs> very special little animal of mine. Little donkey. <laughs> he talks to me all the time when I'm out there. <laughs> I don't know what he says, but he talks. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes follows me around wherever I'm working or doing he's always there oh sweet yeah he's sweet, sweet. more language lessons yeah <laughs> <laughs> when we lived in Jerusalem Jim and I had um, a couple of donkeys and uh, I was my only experience being with donkey, but we had them for like six or seven years. And it's amazing, it was amazing to me to realize how uh, smart and trainable they are. Um, it's, you know, for such a big animal, they're just mischievous and funny and uh, smart and knows to get around things. I was like, whoa, we're supposed to be a donkey. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're so sweet. <laughs> But the, it's amazing what a um, social animal it is and, um, and a protector of his groups. Mm. Um, yes. If we have wild dogs or anything comes in, they know they have learned to stay out of our pastures now. <laughs> 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 they, they fear what Peppy will do to them. So it's... <laughs> Pepe is in charge. He is, and it's it, they are very interesting animals, and um, so different than a lot of other animals. So yeah, <laughs> they are really amazing. They are.
there are any other questions or comments? I, I just think we've learned so much tonight. <clears throat> I know I've been sitting here thinking, gosh, I never really thought about that before. So Hanania, we thank you so much. And um, I'm, I don't know about all of you all, but I'm really looking forward to next week too. Yes. And I hope all of you will, uh, we had 51 tonight, so. Thank all of Excellent. you for participating. And again, if you need um, a recording, if you have to miss one or you want to share one with a friend, just email me and I put it in the chat. It's aspears at fmhouston.com. And of course, Hanania is really getting excited and so am I. And I think Carol's here. I don't yep. know. We're going to um, Israel March the 6th through the 19th. So um, there's still time if you want to go. <laughs> you can still join us. Uh, friends, I hope to see you next week as well. Next week, I'll be talking about the temple and the temple authorities and, what the, and then the, the systems of uh, judgment for Jesus trials. So we're going to get Jesus now to, to the temple and uh, get uh, to the house of Caiaphas and get him into prison uh, and then all the way. And then the fall, the next week, the last time that we'll be together will be the crucifixion and the resurrection. So next time will be Jesus in the temple. Who is in the temple? Which authority we have? Who is who? Uh, their names and their authorities as much as I can put it that together. And then trying to understand um, the accusation that they're making against Jesus and uh, do they hold water or not? Um, you can imagine that we have many good Jewish law, lawyers and people studying those uh, gospel stories to see if that um, really could have happened. Um, would that um, be acceptable on the Jewish court system or does that need to be on the uh, Roman co court system? So we're going to talk to that about and then see what, what we can learn. All right. Hope to see you again next weekend. Next week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you so Thank you, much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Thank you. Bye, Steve. Bye, Hanania. Great to see you. <laughs> I, I was wondering if you can bring me back some holy water from Israel. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I still need to get a shofar from you, too. Oh, so that'd be good. I don't know if you guys have any there at the center at your uh, place. Well, we can we can look for that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Talk to you later. Have a Thanks. good one. Thanks, friend. Thanks, Anne, very much. Okay. Take care, Hanania. Bye-bye.